Uh, so with that, I'm going to let you guys take over and introduce yourselves and go from here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry, sorry. One thing. Um, I lied. I'm not, I'm not done yet. So this is our last talk in the Python track uh, at 2.55 um, Eastern. So in 30 minutes from now, there is a closing um, ceremonies talk. It's going to be the three track leaders. And her. That's going to be over in the closing ceremony track. So there's a link to it from the agenda. If you go to the top left of your screen where you see the schedule and you see the name of the session and you click more, you should see a closing ceremony. The platform should let me bump everyone over to it automatically. So depending on time, I may hop in and do some kind of quick thank you and warn you I'm bumping you, or you may all of a sudden just get unceremoniously dropped into closing ceremony, depending on how things go from time. In any event, head over there for our final thoughts. Um, and that's where we're going to wrap it up. It's not going to be in this track. It's in that specific track. With that said, I hand it over to you. Okay. Hi, um, I would just start presenting the screen. Hello everyone, my name is Faru Singh and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I'm sorry if there's a background uh, noise it's 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 terrible like there's some construction going on my building and I can't have that so yeah I am a software engineer at Red Hat and today we are going to talk about quantum computing on OpenShift with me you have Ismail and Luciano from IBM why don't you introduce yourself yeah hello uh, hello uh, hello people uh, I am Ismail Faro I am the technical lead in the cloud and software part of uh, in IBM research Hello, I'm Luciano. I'm a senior developer in Qiskit, uh, our quantum SDK at IBM. So we will start with the uh, going to talk about how the future of computing is probably going to look like. Then we will discuss some key concepts of quantum computing. Then I will demo how to launch a development environment for implementing quantum algorithm using QSKIT and OpenShift. And the team from IBM would demo how to develop a quantum circuit using QSKIT. So the age of computing started with bits as the only unit of information. Today, we have both bits and neurons at the heart of computing. But there's a newcomer, and that is qubits around the corner, that can give us unprecedented advantage to computing in the fields like biology, AI, physics, you name it. Right now, uh, Sue Summit uh, is the most powerful supercomputer that we have, and it is comprised of bits and neuron system. It can do 200,000 trillion calculations per second. Wow, it's even difficult to say it aloud. But the question is, can it solve all the problems? And the obvious answer is no. And to give you some perspective, uh, it is impossible to completely represent the molecular configuration of caffeine on today's most powerful supercomputer. But we could do so just using 160 qubits on a quantum computer. And if you want to build a classical computer that is capable of doing so, you would have to have at least 10 to the power 48 bits and to build that supercomputer, you would almost consume one to 10% of the total atoms present in the, on the earth. So yes, it's impossible to build such a classical computer. So there are a lot of problems that quantum computer can help us solve, and they can provide us a new path to solve some of the hardest of the most memory intensive problems in business and science. Now, we have some key concepts that whenever you are in a quantum computing group or community, you come across these words. So classical computers are represented by bits that can take value 0 or 1. Quantum bits or qubits can take on those values, but can also represent a combination of 0 or 1 state while you are computing. So if you think as the 0 state as a north pole of the sphere and 1 state as a south pole of the sphere, uh, these you can one of the states can be the equatorial position where the qubits can have the zero state or the one state with equal probability and superposition is creating a quantum state that is a combination of both zero and one state and to do so you pass it through or you pass the qubit through a Hadamard gate 
Similarly, entanglement is a concept that strongly connects two or more qubits so that they quantum states are no longer independent and they behave as a single entity. And to put them into entanglement, you pass them through a control not gate. And Luciano will talk about these gates later in the slide, so don't worry about it. Long as from the IBM quantum team, uh, in IBM research, uh, we're working from a while in this quantum uh, idea. No? In fact, uh, four years ago, we released the first quantum computer, uh, general quantum computer online, uh, uh, has a lot of success. No? Thinking that in the beginning, like Parul said, in this moment, uh, if you try to simulate something, uh, we need to have a, a one interesting number of qubits uh, in the beginning when we released the first version of, of quantum experience our first quantum system online we have only five qubits no uh, nowadays last week we released one device that have uh, 65 qubits and just today we announced that into in 2020 23 we are going to to be able to release one device that can handle 1000 qubits no this means the hardware is very important for us because finally is uh, how we can manipulate these qubits, no? But obviously uh, uh, the software is other the big important part in our all uh, ecosystem of, of tools. Uh, in 2007, I was one of the, the first contributors to, to try to release the first version of Quisky, no? And after that, uh, Quisky is uh, our, uh, 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 our uh, first uh, and our open source solution to allow to people to create uh, algorithms and create circuits and create all the software on top of this hardware to allow to the people in one moment to, to create or build some kind of application that try to connect the real world with this quantum computer uh, uh, era. Uh, additionally, we work and have some kind of services to, to teach people and to help to people to understand how work these quantum computers and obviously to have access to these quantum computers. This thing connects with the last pillar for us, that is the quantum community. You know? We try to pay a lot of attention in, in, in teach uh, people how, how works this quantum computing uh, uh, phenomena and how you can develop something uh, using whiskey on top of all of the, these uh, layers of the, of the abstraction that, that I, we are going to show to you. Uh, uh, additionally, we work with researchers, developers and business and companies to try to figure out what are going to be the next things to, to continue to address or, 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 or define what are going to be the next ch challenge and try to, to cover that using our hardware and our software. Next slide, please. This video is, uh, is a video that shows to you is like all the executions that happened in the last four years. In the beginning, uh, obviously, we have more simulators that quantum devices, thinking that in the beginning we have only one quantum device and we have several simulators on the cloud. But nowadays, we have, uh, uh, we delivered in the last four years 29 quantum devices and if you can see, I don't know, it's, it's easy to see in this moment, the, the, the blue line is the, is the execution in the real chips and the red line is the execution in the, in the, in the simulators. Uh, in this moment, we have more than 250,000 users registered in our platform and you can see that the execution in the last two years uh, is most in the, our quantum real devices. And that helped us to pass from the research to the production. Next slide. And obviously to try to achieve all, all of this execution and allow to the people to use our quantum devices, like we mentioned it before, we have this Quisky that is our open source SDK. And Luciano are going to show to you in detail how you can develop your first uh, Hello World, uh, your first quantum Hello World. But uh, for, for have a very high view about what what is this uh, Quisky uh, SDK or what is the element that try to cover, uh, we have this like a le levels of the abstraction. No? On the top, the applications and programs obviously is the most easy way to allow to the people to enter and start to interact with our, our quantum devices and our quantum algorithms. One example, like Parul said, is like example in applications we have or we try to support uh, uh, chemistry simulation, machine learning, or optimization problems. This means some, uh, some uh, expert in this kind of areas can use the quantum devices without need to go in deep 
and understand what happened behind the scenes in these quantum uh, uh, devices. The next level is the, the, the patterns and the circuits. No? The circuits is finally is, uh, our building blocks. And Luciano are going to show to you in detail how you can develop this uh, uh, or use the, the, these elements to develop your first quantum program. No? After that, we have this transpiler that in the general world for us is uh, like a compiler because it helps us to optimize the quantum programs on top of the of the specific quantum devices no uh, thinking that we in this moment use uh, some kind of technology that allow to us to manipulate these quantum uh, quantum devices or qubits uh, using microwave pulses the next level is the the experimentalist tools is the 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 layer that the the our researchers use to improve our our qubits and all of the hardware in low level uh, uh, assets and after that we have obviously simulators to allow to the people to simulate in your local machine or in the cloud uh, uh, made simulations quantum simulation in a very easy way and after that use the quantum device to, to fi finalize or to try to compare if your program ran in the same way or not and the last layer that is the ibm provider is the connector that connect your quiz key in local or in the cloud with our quantum hardware Next slide. So uh, I work at Red Hat in the Emerging Technologies in the office of CTO. And right now what we are doing is exploring mechanism to connect the classical and the quantum world together. And I emphasize we are not productizing this right now. We are just doing exploratory work. With OpenShift, we have one of the best of the classical computing environments. And uh, IBM Research has developed quantum computers based on superconducting qubits. So we are prototyping to define the best practices for running heterogeneous workflow in a coprocessor model using OpenShift and IBM Quantum Services. Like uh, Parul mentioned, is like our idea is to have this hybrid cloud uh, between the user, the cloud, and obviously the, our real devices, or real quantum devices. And uh, from our side, uh, the strategy is very simple. It's like continues to double down in the open source uh, part that is our QuizKey uh, uh, framework. And you can see in this diagram that in the cloud, we, we use obviously uh, the, all this knowledge and all this development in, in the in the QuizKey side, like part of our services, because finally the transpilation, all the optimizations can happen in local or can, ha can happen in the cloud. And in the same way, that when the people need to use this kind of, of uh, quantum algorithms on the very high level, uh, uh, abstraction level in the in the our software stack, need to have some kind of ability to to execute this like a, a, a part of the our cloud uh, services uh, on the uh, our cloud stack. Uh, in our collaboration with Red Hat, the idea uh, again is uh, going in the same direction, it's like try to make open source all these elements that we are w working on. And the OpenShift QuizKey operator is one example. No? Uh, for us, the OpenShift QuizKey operator is the one of the, the key elements to allow to someone to de deploy in a very easy way the QuizKey and all the QuizKey uh, tools. Uh, in a, a one environment in one click no? that for, for us is, is perfect no? and from the other side in our cloud architecture obviously we 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 use OpenShift to, to try to improve all of our uh, deployment from all of our microservices that we have on the cloud and we are working to to use this operator like part of the, our room time to be, to improve our way to store and execute uh, our quantum progress on the cloud. Next slide. So now I can demo you how the QSKIT, OpenShift QSKIT operator works. So basically what it does is that it launches Jupyter Server and you can access Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and this Jupyter Notebook will have all the dependencies and the, the package of QSKIT for 
like if you are working for chemistry, then uh, a specialized optimized package for QSkit and chemistry that works together would be available. And the developer who is mostly called quantum scientist, he is an expert in writing or implementing quantum algorithm. So it's not his, uh, uh, he need not care about the configuration or the, uh, the matching of the dependencies. All he needs to do is like with the hit of the button, install the operator. So here's a demo. You need to go to the operator hub of your OpenShift environment. And from there, uh, just uh, search for the operator by the keyword QSkit. And that you, uh, you can see that the OpenShift QSkit operator is available. You install it to a specific namespace or to the entire cluster, it's up to you. Uh, I, have I have running it into a particular namespace, which is QSkit op. Uh, once it is installed, you have to create an instance of the CRD. And basically what the CRD is a Jupyter server. Uh, go to your project to see the status. You can see that the pods are running and they are ready. And once they are ready, it exposes the Jupyter server using a route. And everyone in the team can just access and create new instance of the Jupyter Notebook using the routes. So with this operator, we have given to demo Jupyter Notebook. Um, and as you can see, you don't need to do any pip install. Uh, the Jupyter Notebook is in, already comes with all the necessary dependencies. And the last slide uh, before to enter in the in the code uh, is again to try to bring to you some as minimum explanations about the, what is this building blocks and how this look for uh, the next slide. When the the quantum uh, science people or developers talk about the pulses, gates, and circuits, this finally is the, the minimum element that you are going to have in this moment nowadays to develop uh, uh, your quantum programs. Uh, and for that, you have these horizontal lines, that is the qubit, that is the Q0, Q1, Q2. And on top of that, thinking that these lines is like your timeline, you can apply some kind of modifiers, no? some kind of operations, no? that is these uh, uh, rectangle boxes uh, or these cir circles. No? Uh, these operations we call gates. And with these gates, we manipulate the state of each of these qubits. No? And at the end, uh, obviously, depending on the technology that you use, at the end, you need to convert this in something that you can send to the real qubit and manipulate the state of this qubit. And that is the thing that happened in the right side, that is these pulses. This means all of these gates that are on top of these lines that finally is each of these qubits is something that we translate in microwave pulses that we send to each of our qubits to manipulate and make operations in that, in that case. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's uh, see how how this um, th this case works at the end, right? I consider myself a quant a relatively new into the quantum world, and as a consequence, I always try to connect classical concepts into the quantum concepts. For example, this uh, gate that we have here on top is the XOR gate, takes two bits uh, and returns the, the result in another bit and after, uh, after applying an exclusive OR operation. Similarly, there is a quantum gate doing something similar to that. It's called C0. It's here in the bottom. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it works a bit like an if statement, right? Yeah, the gate controls on the state of the wire in X and if uh, the, the wire is x, uh, sorry, if the wire is one, applies a not gate into the y um, wire in the bottom, and, and, and that's kind of like makes it similar to the to the XOR gate that we have here in the top. Notice that uh, unlike the classical XOR, the quantum C0 is reversible. That means that you that you can reconstruct the input if you know the output. So uh, in order to to increase the similarity to in between these two two gates, we have to add this extra wire here on top. Uh, so now, now they are even more similar. Again, they are not exactly the same, but for the sake of connecting concepts, I think I think that will make it. And now that we know how to the C0 work, uh, the C0 gate works, we're going to connect that C0 gate with the Haramar gate that that we that we know from, from before. This Haramar gate that puts uh, qubits into superposition. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is to import a uh, Qiskit, which is the IBM Quantum uh, Computing SDK. And we're going to create a quantum register uh, of length two. Here in this line, the, the, the quantum register and the uh, another classical register for put the result of our computation, also length two. And then we have those two registers into a quantum circuit. Then we apply the Hadamard gate on the on the qubit zero, and then uh, on the qubit zero and one, we're going to apply the C naught gate, represented here as CX. And then we're going to measure the results. The circuit roughly, well, not roughly, like it looks exactly like this, right? Uh, and this is usually known as the as the hello world of the quantum world. It's the it's known as the Bell state. So now let's let's try running this this uh, this circuit one thousand times into a local simulator that is installed in our computer. You can see that roughly the result says that we most of the time or half of the time uh, the result was one one and half of the time was zero zero. That means there is a dependency between uh, the first. Uh, bit and the second bit that this this notion is called it uh, an as entanglement this this relationship between these two these two bits and you're probably asking yourself okay what i can use this for and that's where the touch algorithm enters the touch algorithm was specifically designed with the purpose of uh, illustrating a situation where a quantum computer can do something better than a classical computer so uh, it sets a, a challenge where, where in a classical computer requires two executions and in a quantum computer it can be solved with only one execution. So imagine that you have a function that takes only one bit and returns only one bit. So there are only four possible functions like those ones, right? They're here as F1, F2, F3, F4 here in the top. And, uh, and, and let's split those four functions in two. Some of them are called balance, and some of them are called constant. Uh, if we if we want to to so 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 a constant function is when when the the, the result of that of, of the output does not depend on the input, and a balance function it does depend on the input, right? Uh, so in a classical execution, we need we need to do two executions: one with the input zero, another one one with the input one. Uh, Let's 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 them the let's take the, 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 the video run a bit because I think I'm getting ahead of myself. In a in a quantum execution, it's possible to do this with only only one execution. Uh, and oracles, so 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 this function we're going to put it inside a box that we call an oracle. And we can ask anything to the oracle and we can see the result of the oracle, but we cannot open the oracle, we cannot see what is inside, right? And the challenge is that is with one execution, can you answer the question, is this function balanced or constant? So therefore we need to, to, to also interpret that oracle as a gate, and therefore it's also reversible. And notice that you have extra wires in the, in the, in the, in the quantum situation, because we, we had to make sure that that, uh, that, that function is, uh, is, is reversible. Hello, maybe you can fast forward a bit. Thank you. Wait. Okay. <laughs> so you know, you know that you to to do this to 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 represent this this uh, this situation. First, the first spot, the first thing that we have to do is to have all these functions as quantum circuits. And that's what we're going to do in the, in the, in the, in the next section. I think that you can use the arrows on the back and forth, right? The first situation is the constant zero. Doesn't matter the input, the output will always be zero. That's one of the functions that we have. The other one is the constant one. Doesn't matter the input, the output is always one. And we flip the ground situation zero into one just by adding a not get here represented as an X. X means not in the quantum world. Kind of. The next situation is the identity. Identity means that uh, if the input is one, the output is one, and if the input is zero, the output is zero. And we know how to do that already with a, with a C not gate. 
So they, they, when, when the input is zero, the X gate will be triggered in the bottom, and therefore the output also, uh, sorry, sorry, when the input is one, the, C not, uh, the not gate will be triggered in the bottom, and therefore the output will be zero. And the last one is invert, which is like kind of like identity, but we flip the bit at the end, right? When the input is zero, the output has to be one, and when the input is one, the output has to be zero. So that we have all these four uh, functions now, and now we have to run them just to see how, how that works. Uh, the first scenario, for example, here is the invert. We put it between these two bars. Is, and we also try to this function with the input one. Zero, not, is one. And when we execute this, uh, this circuit, the output should be zero. It's the invert function, remember? So that means that works roughly uh, like, like, like as we expected, right? We can try uh, also this situation with, uh, with identity. So the also the input is still one. And now the, the, the output is also one because it's the identity, it's the identity function. So now that we have all these four functions, we're going to put them as inside these boxes and then inside the Deutsch algorithm that can answer the question, is that Oracle balance or constant and for that we're not going to enter in the, in the in the details but we're going to put some gates around the function and that and that's the algorithm itself and the oracle it's here inserted in line six for example in this case we insert the oracle one as a black box we cannot open that box here we see how the the, the circuit looks like and based on the on the on the execution of this uh, of this uh, program we are trying to answer the question if this oracle behaves as a balance or as a constant function. So here, in this case, for example, is the oracle one. And when we execute it, we, we execute it only, uh, well, the, if, the, if the answer is one, it's, it's because it's balanced. And if the answer is zero, it's because it's constant. And notice that we are executing this uh, uh, on, only once, right? In, in line one, you can see that the shots are are one, All right? So with uh, Deutsch algorithms telling us that the Oracle one is in this case, balance. Let's scroll up to see if that's the case. Identity is a balance function. So therefore Deutsch uh, did it correctly in only one shot. Let's check now with another Oracle. Let's take, for example, the Oracle three. And let's also execute again. And here we, need, we see that it's constant, the last approach. So let's check it out if Oracle 3 was behaving as constant. Indeed, it's constant 1. So it, it, in, in only one shot, we could answer the question, right? But not everything is so nice in quantum computing. Some, some things are, are complicated, are more complicated than classically. And one of those sorts of complications is the fact that real computers are noisy. They have noise uh, uh, results. So let's try to run the same circuit, but now in a real uh, cloud. Uh, let's first by importing uh, the, 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 the new functions. We're also going to load our uh, IBM Q account in order to use the, 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 the cloud service. And we're going to ask uh, the cloud to give us the least VC uh, backend that has at least two qubits. See, this, this process takes some time. Uh, also, we want to make sure that we are not using a simulator because uh, uh, also IBM Cloud provides us with uh, simulators. So we're going to use a real computer with at least two qubits. And from all those, uh, from all that offer, we want to take the one that is, it has less jobs in the queue. Here, IBM Q Orense has uh, five qubits and only uh, four pending jobs in the queue. So it's the one that we're going to use. And we're going to run exactly the same Deutsch algorithm that we ran before, but 1,000 times instead of only one. Um, and instead of using the simulator, we're going to run the, the, this IBM Q or answer, uh, which is one of the, of the multiple computers that are available for you to use. So with execution, we take a job, and now with the job that puts uh, our circuit in the queue, we need to wait until the, the, the circuit is, uh, is the queue and then process. This takes some time. That's why I'm for fast forwarding a bit the video. Uh, but at some point, it will, 
it, it will it will return a status that is not Q. Okay, now it's running. Now it's in the physical circuit, uh, in the physical chip, and it's a very small circuit, so probably quickly it will be it will be done. Now it's done, so we can analyze the the results. It's ex exactly the same circuit that we ran before locally, but now we're going to see what are the results in the in in the real device. So remember that the real result was that the, 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 the function that we were analyzing was constant. And now we have, uh, after 1,000 executions, we're going to do the same process. And notice that most of the time, the answer is the correct one, is constant. But, but not always. In some situations, uh, in a roughly 2% of the situations, we see that uh, the, the result was balanced, was the wrong result. And this happened because of noise. Noise in quantum computers is something that is impossible to avoid, and it's everywhere. It's in the in the when we set the qubits, when we read the qubits, when we operate the qubits. All those operations introduce more and more noise. Even just letting time pass introduce noise by 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 a process called as decoherence, because the qubits they, they lose their state when they move forward. So noise is is, is the big enemy of of a quantum computer. And, and, and that's why we need to execute things more than once in order to, to make sure that the result that we want is, that the result that we want is the, the most probable one. Uh, hopefully this demo uh, is an invitation to, to, for you to play more with Qiskit. We're going to put a link to the notebook so you can jump into the details and you can dive in into all the things that I just go, uh, like went through quickly at the end of the, of the presentation. That we have a lot of resources online. We have the quantumcomputingibn.com that allows you uh, learn using only the drag and drop without the code. And we have some kind of tutorials that allow you to learn how work uh, all these quantum mechanics behind the scenes and what is the relevance of the use of the circuits and how you create your first circuits. And the other side, like we mentioned it all the time, we have this quiz key. And this is the, the two uh, most uh, significant things that, that we bring to the community to allow to the people to learn and finally create new programs and, and algorithms and experiments. This is like. So you're free to ask this question if anybody has. So I've been keeping an eye on chat. It's looking fairly quiet in terms of questions. Um, you guys went right up to the time, so that's actually quite perfect. Um, thank you very much. I uh, was super excited to have this talk in the track. Um, Barul and I worked together a couple months ago on getting this stuff initially kickstarted into the operator. Um, and I've been kind of keeping my eye on it. So as soon as we had this Python track, this is one of the first talks I wanted to reach out to. So thank you. Thank you uh, to you guys from IBM who I never um, I uh, appreciate you guys coming into this. Um, and that's all we have for the Python check. Uh, it has been a very interesting, very dense couple of hours here as we jump from operators over to micro PPNV and talk about installation dependencies and then to AIML and Flask and now ending on this really cool quantum concept. Um, so I want to send a thank you again to all of my speakers. I really appreciate your time and effort in all of this. Um, sorry, can we start over? I missed everything past the original Welcome to the Python track. We just kind of do it again. Um, so now we're going to be moving out to uh, the closing track. I was actually wrong. I can't push people into it. The moderator in that channel will pull people over. Honestly, your best bet is going to be just going to the top under schedule. Let me drop out here so we see the faces. Um, Top next to the schedule, you'll see a more drop down next to my name for the Python track hosted by Jason Dobies. If you click more, uh, you will see closing ceremony. Uh, if you want to hop over to that room now, um, we're going to be uh, finishing up the closing ceremony there. Uh, to you three from the quantum track, if you didn't have any links you wanted to share, the Slack room will be sticking around well past this. That's going to be the best spot for kind of persistent links that people can follow up on that they haven't um, been following or been necessarily copying down in this chat. Um, Yes, again, a lot of good feedback here. It's fascinating. So thank you to everyone. I will see you all over in the closing uh, ceremony room in a couple of minutes. Take care, everyone. Oh, thanks. Bye-bye.